Hey, um, so this is a short uh, walkthrough of chapter 8.1, um, which deals with the uh, sampling distribution of a sample mean. Um, chapter 8 is a pretty short chapter, um, and it really bridges the gap between probability, which is what we did in the second section, and inference, which is what we'll do in the third section. And the main idea here is sampling distributions. So the idea is, if you imagine a population, if we pull out a sample, we'll get a particular uh, group of answers, right? So if you think of, we have a bucket of uh, bingo balls, we'll pull some out and they'll have an average. If we put those back in and pull out another sample, we would get a different average. But over the whole um, set of possibilities, so in the case of bingo balls, that would be 75 choose, however many we're picking, we could think about what possibilities we have. Now, bingo balls are nice because they're a particular uh, set, but often when we think about a sampling distribution, it's a perspective one because we can't really know what the actual uh, data will look like, you know, if we're imagining not just, you know, giant groups, but maybe even things that haven't happened. So what will all cars that our factory makes next year look like? And so sampling distributions are a really good way to kind of bridge this gap from probability where we can do math to inference where we're going to use the probability to draw conclusions about what we have. Now sampling distributions, just like other random variables, will have a shape, a center, and a standard deviation or a spread. So for instance, we could think about, um, again, a population of whatever size. It has a true mean um, that we can think about, a true mean of mu and a true standard deviation of sigma, but for each sample, we're going to have an x bar and an s sub x for each one. And so that idea that um, we have to think about each population, uh, and I'm sorry, not each population, each sample separately is cool. Now in practice, we're only going to take one sample. So this idea of a sampling distribution really is another theoretical construct from probability, but it's going to give us a way to think about our actual sample that we have in the context of all of the possibilities that we could have. <clears throat> so for example, um, if we think about dice with four sides, little triangles, if you play Dungeons and Dragons or some cool game, uh, you would see these dice. And it'd be easy to find that there's four outcomes and it has means 2.5 and standard deviation 1.18. Now, because this is a small enough thing, if um, we were to imagine throwing the die three times, we would get a sample of a sequence, right? So 111 or 112 or whatever. We can list all of those possibilities. And Dr. Love on her slide did that for us, which is great, right? It's gonna be four times four times four, which is 64 outcomes. <clears throat> and if we do that, it's gonna have the mean for each one. So if we roll three ones, the mean is one. If we roll two one three, the mean is gonna be two. If we roll uh, three two two, the mean is gonna be 2.3 all the way up to 444, which will give us a mean of four. Okay, and so <clears throat> that's kind of interesting. But what's funny about it, if we do that, we can see that the mean and this sampling distribution matches the mean of the population. It turns out this is always true. There are mathematical reasons for this. The book explains it in a little bit more detail. And notationally, we always write this as mu sub x bar. So that's the mean of the mean, the mean of the mean. The mean of the sampling distribution, right? So that's a weird uh, thing to say. English doesn't handle it very well, but the idea that the mean of the sampling distribution is the same as the mean of the population is sort of handy and good to know. Where it gets a little tricky is with the standard deviation. It turns out that the mean of a sampling distribution is smaller than the mean of the population, and it turns out it has this crazy relationship between the mean and the sample size. So the idea that we pulled three uh, we rolled the die three times, it turns out that the standard deviation is one uh, over square root of three of the standard deviation of the uh, overall thing. It's nuts. So if we take that theoretical uh, random variable, the sampling distribution for the standard deviation is smaller at a relationship of the square root. Okay, so that's kind of cool and kind of weird but that square root of n on the bottom of the fraction is going to be really important for the whole rest of the semester. <laughs> We're going to call that the standard error. So sigma of x bar 
is going to be sigma of the random variable more broadly divided by this uh, square root of our sample size. Okay, and again, that formula is going to be really interesting and useful for some of the stuff we're going to be doing later. Even though it seems like it's just this abstraction, like why are you telling me this? It's going to come back again and again in this third and even the fourth part of the class and in other courses that you take about statistics or ones that use statistics. So we could look at um, things like this where we know that uh, you know some mean and standard deviation exist. We can go ahead and calculate that and uh, find it from there. Now, the shape of the distribution is really interesting. Maybe it's not so interesting that if the population is normal, the distribution of that sampling mean is going to also be normal. What is nuts, and the one thing that you need to learn from chapter eight, is that if the population is not normal, the shape will keep features from the original distribution, but as that sample size increases, that square root of n on the bottom, as that gets bigger, that distribution is going to look more and more normal. That relationship is called the central limit theorem. So the central limit theorem is the idea that as your sample size increases, the distribution of your mean is going to look more and more normal as the sample size increases. Now, those of you who have had calculus would uh, not be surprised to learn that this is a limit. And so the limit as n goes to infinity is that the standard distribution, the standard deviation uh, makes a distribution that is normal. What is, again, just nuts is that how big is big enough that it's close enough that we don't care? 30, right? So if we're saying, oh, the limit as n goes to infinity, the very mathy thing, how big is infinity before we're close enough to infinity that it's okay? 30, right? So that idea is one that's going to help us out because sample sizes of 30 aren't that crazy to get. And we can then make the assumption that our distribution of our mean follows a normal distribution. And that's going to be really handy for us. If your data looks more normal, then you need even fewer than 30. And in lots of cases, having 10 is enough that the normal distribution is fine. What's great about that, and the reason why in the second part of the course we spent so, right, chapter seven was all about the normal distribution, is because the central limit theorem says, if the thing we're studying is the mean, we're interested in the average of something, and the sample size we're gonna take is sufficiently large, we can treat the distribution as normal, even if the data itself comes from some weird distribution that isn't normal. Okay, so we can think about different examples. And again, as long as the uh, sample size is big enough or the population is normal enough to start with, we can treat the data like it's normal, whether it is or not. Okay, again, there's the table of uh, distributions that we could look up in the back of the book. We're going to use norms dist or norm dist uh, to calculate that amount, but we can figure out that standard deviation using uh, these calculations. So what we can get from that is to say, if we have a sampling distribution that we think it follows, how weird is the data that we get? How unusual is the sample that we found? So for instance, if we have a sample of 35 students, where the mean was equal to eight and the standard deviation was equal to two, how weird is it that a sample of 35 would have a mean of 7.16 hours or smaller? So we would calculate that z-score or we'd plug it in. So we would do norms dist of minus 2.48 and say, well, that's pretty unlikely that you would get a mean of 7.16 or smaller. Um, this is from a data set about sleeping habits and the conclusion that, hey, it's kind of weird if the uh, sample mean is 7.16 or smaller. This is important because what we can do from that is then say, well, the normal population, the general population, I shouldn't say normal, right? The general population has a mean of eight. This sample of college students that I had, they have a mean of 7.16. Is it reasonable to think that they have the same mean as the overall population? And the answer is no. So again, that's maybe not the most interesting conclusion you've ever seen, but the idea that um, we can use this to see does our theory match our data. That's what we're going to be doing in chapters 9 and 10 and beyond as we do that. Okay, um, so we can think about that sampling distribution, the mean and standard deviation, convert that to the standard normal. When we go look it up on our normal table, we say, gosh, that's a teeny, teeny, tiny little bit. And from that, we can then conclude that our data is in fact unusual. In a more formal way, that's exactly what statistical inference is. 
That's how we determine if drugs work. That's how we determine if psychology exams work. That's how we determine um, lots of things in the world. The question of here's a theory. Is our data consistent with that theory or is it weird relative to that theory? If the difference is interesting, if the theory doesn't match, we call that significant. And again, that's what we're going to be doing in chapters 9 and 10. So chapter 8.2, we'll start in a second, is going to do the same thing for uh, proportions. So we'll get to that here in a second. <laughs> 